This video is sponsored by Only Crits. When do you roll for initiative? This video topic was voted on by Patreon supporters who donate $15 a month. I have semi-regular polls about what video topics I should cover, so if you want to help have a say in what videos I make, the Patreon is a great way to do that. First, I want to establish some fundamentals about why initiative works the way it does in Dungeons & Dragons. The basics of initiative are pretty straightforward. Everyone in a combat scenario rolls a d20 and adds their bonuses, and the higher you roll, the faster you act in combat. The reason we do this is purely so we can abstract what would otherwise be a pretty difficult situation to adjudicate. Because really, in the chaos of battle, everyone will be doing their own thing, and if everyone at the table actually tries to tell you all at once what they want to do, who they want to attack, where they want to go, it would become a nightmare to handle. We take turns to make it easier for everybody to know what's going on, to change their tactics mid-fight, and to make sure nobody talks over anybody else. In social situations or exploration sequences, one or two players might wind up taking the reins of the scenario while others hang back or maybe even feel left out. But initiative is specifically designed to give everyone a chance to participate. However, initiative is sort of unlike anything else in the core rules of the game because there's really no attempt to justify it in the fiction of the world. Class abilities and magic spells all tend to include at least a little bit of flavor text so that you understand the fantasy that these rules are attempting to recreate. The best monsters work the same way. Their design and mechanics neatly line up with their artwork and their lore. But initiative doesn't work that way. Initiative is the one time the designers basically said, look, this isn't realistic, but at the end of the day, this is a game. And this is the only way to keep things fair and make sure everybody has an opportunity to act. There are plenty of other optional rules that do the same thing with other aspects of the world or the story, but as far as the core rules go, Initiative is the mechanic that is the most divorced from the story of the game and how the fictional world would actually work. Well, okay, you can make a case that the way diagonal distances are measured is also abstracted for the same reason, but the difference is that some tables will never have to deal with diagonal distances in D&D. I find it only comes up in my games like once or twice per year. Initiative, however, is pretty much expected to be part of every D&D campaign. And in fact, it's how we assume most major story beats will have to be resolved. Some players expect it in every session. Also, this is a tangent, but I want to point out, I want to point this out all the same. You can maybe also argue that inspiration is also a mechanic that doesn't represent a specific aspect of the fiction of the world, but inspiration is a really recent addition to the game. It was only added with 5th edition. And honestly, the fact that the one D&D playtest keeps trying out completely different rules for inspiration means the designers really don't know what they want to do with it at all. So it's kind of hard for a mechanic like that to represent anything in the world of the game when they can't even agree on how it should function. But that's a subject for another day. In discourse about initiative, especially in the last few months as D&D is being compared to so many other games, which is a good thing, by the way. D&D should be compared to other games so we can figure out what it does well and whether or not it's right for your group. But I've heard some people say that it feels like initiative yanks your group into a totally different game. Recently on the Eldritch Lorecast, I heard this dichotomy expressed again as James Hake compared 5e to Pokemon. Mostly you're exploring the world in a role-playing game, and then sometimes the music changes and you drop into a minigame that has a totally different feel. And on the one hand, I don't think that's 100% accurate. In fact, I think it's more the other way around. Almost all of the player's abilities are built around combat, so in reality, it's more like the combat sections of the game are the part the designers have spent the most time on. What happens outside of initiative tends to be radically different from table to table, and thus the rules are generally less specific about how to handle these sections of the game. And when the designers do want to offer guidance for non-combat activities, they'll create other optional minigames like the Shopping for Magic Items minigame, the Chasing Someone Through the Streets minigame, or the Large-Scale Combat minigame. Sometimes it's literally a different game. But that's also why I totally understand the sentiment of folks who feel like initiative functions like a separate game, because it's the one aspect of the core rules that feels the most like a game mechanic. And especially since dungeon masters have basically free reign to do whatever they want outside of combat, throwing out or adding whatever they want to suit the story or the world. The fact that everyone in the world who plays this game is expected to default to the same system once initiative is rolled does literally make it seem like the one part of the game everybody has to play, regardless of how you run your campaign. But there's a virtue to the initiative system. It's fair. 
everyone gets a chance to act, and there's technically a chance that anybody will get to act in any order, which hopefully keeps things unpredictable from combat to combat. This is part of why I like the current initiative system way more than most other initiative systems I've interacted with. I'm not a huge fan of systems where the players choose what order they act in from turn to turn, because I find that players almost inevitably fall into a recurring pattern fight after fight, and the same people wind up going first almost every time, at least in very crunchy games. There are some games where I think that works fine, but in crunchy games I just don't feel like it adds anything that isn't already covered by D&D's existing initiative system. And D&D specifically can't use that approach. Too many spells or class features have durations that end on your turn. So you can't keep swapping initiative with other players because the game is too crunchy, too detailed to work that way. And I especially dislike systems that propose you re-roll initiative every turn, or where your initiative is determined by what weapon you're using, or whether you plan to cast a spell. I hate systems where you decide at the top of the round what you're going to want to do on your turn, and then that determines your initiative for the round. That approach robs players of the ability to course correct once the battlefield changes. It's meant to simulate fast-paced combat, but because you're already locked in, these systems assume that it would be unrealistic for you to react and change tactics no matter what has happened on anybody else's turn. Oh, the villain turned into a dragon? Hope what you plan to do still makes sense because you can't change your mind now. In my opinion, we don't need to strip away people's ability to react to what happens in combat. We instead need to suspend our disbelief and use kind of a silly system so that we can resolve what every player wants to do. Even things like how do ties and initiative work can wind up being very silly if you try to take them too seriously. I'm gonna pick on Matt Mercer a bit, but don't worry, I'll say nice things about him in a minute. Throughout the Vox Machina campaign, he seemed to really struggle with how to handle ties and initiative. The most obvious example, to me, was in episode 79. During a huge fight, Grog got the same initiative score as the big boss. Matt basically resolved it by having Grog start his turn normally, and then partway through his turn every round, the villain suddenly interrupted and resolved their entire turn. And then Grog could finish his turn. It seems like this was Matt attempting to justify initiative through the narrative of the game. If we assume that initiative isn't an abstraction, but it's literally what's happening in the fiction, then when two creatures tie, you would try to explain that by showing them literally acting simultaneously. It's an effort to make initiative make more sense. But by the time Campaign 2 began, Matt had instead decided to resolve ties by comparing dexterity bonuses. Whoever has the higher dex bonus wins the tie in initiative. If the bonuses are the same, just roll another d20. Whoever rolls higher gets to go first. And all this is resolved during the initiative roll, before the fight actually begins. Because he realized that initiative is an abstract system. It's an imperfect representation of the chaos of battle. But it's consistent and clear, and that is more important for the purposes of gameplay. Of course, the way he asks everyone for their initiative score it still drives me crazy. 25 to 20, 20 to 15, it makes absolutely no sense. We'll talk about that some other time. Initiative is also a holdover from war games, but when two players are each controlling the movements of an entire army, then after that first turn, there's usually very little difference made by whomever goes first. They may as well be acting simultaneously. So it doesn't really cause as much friction between what it's trying to simulate and how the system works. With more players, that's not the case anymore. And it's harder for some players, and especially some DMs, to justify having people take turns. And there are some times when taking turns doesn't actually make any sense, so rolling initiative isn't the right move. For example, I've talked before about how Matt Mercer uses a system without initiative for certain chase scenes or escape scenes. He almost resolves them as skill challenges. And I think that approach works really well, because otherwise, if everyone is in initiative but they're all running from one spot to another, the characters functionally stop and start in funky ways. So I don't think you should roll for initiative when the characters are primarily focused on moving. If there's still a chance that enemies on the ground can do the player character's harm, initiative can be very useful, as we saw in episode 13 of the Vox Machina campaign. But if all they're doing is chasing someone, or escaping, and all they need to do is dodge arrows or avoid traps and hazards, then I don't think you need to roll for initiative. In those cases, a simple skill challenge makes a lot more sense. Of course, if you and your players are rolling for initiative, you're going to need some dice to roll with. Which brings us to today's sponsor, Only Crits. Only Crits creates some of the most beautiful dice sets around. They are absolutely stunning. And you don't have to settle for just one set. You can join the Only Crits dice subscription service. The dice you get are so cool and unique, you really won't regret it. And if you visit onlycrits.com slash supergeekmike and use the promo code supergeek at checkout, your support will help this channel as well. 
Once again, that's onlycrits.com slash supergeekmike and use the promo code supergeek. Thank you so much to OnlyCrits for sponsoring the video. Okay, so what happens when the party is in a tense scene with someone and then a player announces something that they would like to do? Maybe they'd like to pull their bow out and fire an arrow, or they cast fireball. Maybe the enemy starts muttering some words for a spell and all the party members describe reaching for their weapons. Well, I would recommend making it clear we are going to resolve this one action and then everyone is going to roll for initiative. I strongly suggest you let them know that an initiative roll is coming and nobody else will get a chance to do anything else before the roll. There are some times when everyone starts acting at the same time, enemies and players both describe what they're about to do, and that they're about to act basically simultaneously. So in those cases, in my opinion, nobody should get a bonus attack before initiative starts. But if one person is directly, clearly responsible for shifting the scene from tense moment to we are fighting, then I do think you should resolve that action before initiative starts. However, something to be mindful of. Make sure it's not the same person every time. If you reward someone's instigator behavior by giving them an extra attack before the fight actually starts, they might keep on doing that. And that is basically a one-way ticket to conditioning them to become a murder hobo, who will kill first and ask questions never. If that becomes a problem, I, then I recommend you talk to them and say to the entire group, hey, my intention was never to give someone a free pass to keep getting a free attack before every battle, every time, so we're not going to do this anymore. The other solution is to give them a taste of their own medicine, have your enemies start doing that to them. But while I do think that solves some situations, in this case, I think that would be a bad idea. Going down that road will absolutely teach your players that they should strike first when conversations don't seem like they're going their way. And that's a very hard bell to unring. Something else to note, though, is that being the first person to strike does not necessarily mean that all of their enemies are surprised, because the rules on surprise are pretty clear. If two groups can see each other, and they know about each other before combat breaks out, then when things start to get tense and people are about to fight, all parties involved just roll for initiative. However, if some participants aren't aware that the other folks rolling initiative are even around, then those oblivious participants might be surprised, which means they don't act in the first round of combat. Now, if someone doesn't know that they're about to get attacked, that doesn't mean that they are surprised. Surprise really only happens when some participants truly have no idea that the attacker is even present. This is simple enough. However, I do think how you present this information to the group is pretty important. Back when my group played 4th edition, we had a pretty flawed approach to presenting surprise fights. I've double-checked, and this really isn't an issue with the rules for surprise in 4th edition. This was an issue with how we handled the beginning of certain combat encounters. 4th edition rules were similar enough to 5e rules. There was something called a surprise round instead of surprised being a condition, as it is now, but the gist was the same. Everyone still rolled for initiative, but if you were surprised because you didn't know the attackers were around, you didn't get to do anything for the first round of combat. However, in a lot of our games, when the party would be surprised by an enemy, the DM would call for an initiative roll without explaining anything around that would actually, you know, justify initiative. And the players would roll, but would be wondering, wait, why are we rolling? What's happening? We would start initiative, and the players who rolled high would have no idea what they were supposed to do. I saw this happen when I was a DM, and when I was a player, it was just an issue with our group's style of play. And the issue wasn't the mechanic. It was the failure to properly convey information. Around the time we moved to 5th edition, we figured out what we were doing wrong. We started describing something happening that surprised the party, like arrows launching out of the bushes, or a big monster swooping in out of the darkness. And then we'd call for an initiative roll, and we'd explain that they were surprised and wouldn't act in that first round of combat. This is exactly what we could have done in 4th edition as well, we just didn't know better. All we needed to do was offer a narrative explanation before the initiative roll. So here's my next piece of advice, and it may seem obvious, but it's something that would have helped me and my friends a lot if someone had told us this 15 years ago. Ask the party to roll for initiative after you've already introduced whatever they're expected to fight, and or made it clear that there's going to be a fight. Because I may have lied to you a little bit. The players wouldn't just ask, why are we rolling for initiative when they couldn't see the enemy combatants? They'd also ask this when the DM called for an initiative roll, but the players didn't know why their opponent might want to fight them, or when they just didn't want to get into a fight and wanted to handle things diplomatically. There are times when a DM might call for an initiative roll not because they assume everyone is going to fight to the death, 
but just because the order of operations is important. It matters whether the barbarian gets to the lever to open the cage and unleash the chimera, or whether the wizard can stop him from executing this terrible plan by destroying the chain that connects the lever to the cage door. Sure, roll for initiative. You're clearly not trying to kill each other, but you've got conflicting plans, and whoever gets there first will have a huge impact on whatever happens next. But there can be friction when the DM calls for initiative when there are hostile NPCs in the area, but doesn't think the players will fight them to the death. This can either be because the NPCs are arguing with the players, maybe they're trying to capture them, whatever the specifics are, but haven't escalated things to the point of violence. Or, on the complete opposite side of things, it could be that there are some scary monsters that are too dangerous to fight, and the DM expects the players to run. But in either case, here's something important to know. Most adventuring parties refuse to retreat, especially once initiative has been rolled. I've joked about this before, but this is literally the problem of when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. When you roll initiative, it's very hard to then convince the party that they are not expected to kill every, every hostile creature in front of them. Because that's usually how the minigame works. Most times that you roll initiative, the party mentally locks the doors out of the area, and they assume the only way to leave this situation is by fighting their way out. They don't even do this consciously. If you ask for a roll so you can figure out who can get the glowing jade key away from the mind-controlled tavern staff who are trying to steal it from you, they'll begrudgingly roll initiative, because they assume you're telling them the only way to handle this situation is to beat them up, and they don't want to do that. That may not be what you meant, but I speak from experience. That is often the takeaway players have. It might also be the case that the players are trying to do something covertly, or talk their way out of a situation. Or maybe they've got a really good plan. Maybe they plan to get that jade key away by casting a bunch of illusory keys in the air to confuse the mind-controlled tavern staff. And when you call for initiative roll, they might think, oh, I guess our plan failed and we have to fight. That's not what you meant, but that's what they heard. That's the psychology of initiative. If there's a conflict going on that one or two players don't want to get involved with, they might not understand why you're asking them to roll when they don't want to fight that person. They don't want to get in the fight that everyone else is a part of. Again, you're just trying to make sure everyone has a turn so you can keep track of what happens next. So you're asking them to roll because you want them to have the option to intervene if they decide to do so. But again, the problem is that initiative often feels like a combat minigame. Now, am I saying that you should only roll for initiative when you expect things to be a fight to the death, or at least a fight to the last team standing? No, I don't think so. Earlier, I referenced episode 13 of the Vox Machina campaign, and that's a scenario where the party absolutely has to retreat, and Matt gives the players a ton of hints about that. But they still roll for initiative, because the order in which everyone acts matters a lot. I'd argue that there's some very clever reasons Matt has them roll initiative at the end of episode 39, but that's something we'll talk about when we get to that episode. I'm going to have a lot to say about that one. But in both of these cases, Matt was doing a lot of additional signposting to make it clear what was and wasn't expected from the players. That's kind of what you need to do sometimes. You won't always know whether or not your players are taking the wrong conclusion from the fact that you've asked them to roll for initiative. But in cases where you don't expect this to be a fight to the death, I would be very clear about that, however you can be. For example, if you hear a player say, why do we need to roll for initiative, what they're really asking is, why do we need to fight? This is especially true if they don't think they can beat the monster, or if they're trying to execute a clever plan or talk their way out of a situation. And when you hear that, or you know they're in the middle of a plan, then I'd recommend you couch the request for initiative in a larger context. For example, you might say, okay, because you're all trying to make them think you each have the key, and there are so many of you and so many of them, we're gonna need to resolve this in some sort of order. Let's roll for initiative. This might not be a combat encounter, but we need to take, take turns so I can keep track of how this plan is going. Or let's say there are monsters the party doesn't want to fight. You might say something like, okay, these monsters are coming for you. It sounds like you're saying you don't want to stick around, but these things are fast, so we need to see whether you can get away before they can get to you. So let's roll for initiative. Even if you don't stick around to fight, I need to know whether they can get to you before you have time to react. But be aware, this isn't a perfect approach. Anytime I've seen players discuss retreating from monsters, but initiative has been rolled, every time, there's always someone who hangs back to fight a few enemies in an effort to give the others a chance to get away. If they're trying to execute a complex plan, the order of initiative might totally screw up that plan by changing who acts in what order when the plan hinges on the players having more agency. In both of these cases, I might actually recommend something closer to one of those 
other initiative systems that I talked shit about earlier. Maybe you alternate between the players acting and the enemies acting, so that way the players can still choose who acts first, but you can keep interjecting the actions of the opponents in between each player's turn. Because initiative is a system with very strict rules, and it doesn't always suit every situation well. Thank you so much for watching. If you want to support the channel, there are a few ways you can do so. You can subscribe and ring the bell to get notified about new videos as soon as they come out. The more you interact with these videos early in their life cycle, the more YouTube shares my videos to a wider audience. You can support me financially by joining my Patreon. My next goal is to get to 350 patrons, which will allow me to get a new camera. You might have noticed some visual glitches in some of my videos. That seems to be because I film all of my videos on my iPhone. Having a dedicated camera for my videos would help me improve the video quality and keep those glitches from happening. As of filming, we are way more than halfway to that goal, which is really exciting. If you can't support me financially, I totally understand. You can still join my community by signing up for my Discord and hanging out with a bunch of other viewers who just love RPGs. Whenever a video comes out, the Discord members talk about it and share their own insights, and they're usually able to come to these subjects from a bunch of other perspectives that give everyone a lot to think about. And the fourth and final way you can support the channel is by signing up for my newsletter, where I will send some occasional updates about what I've got going on. Since initiative is so closely tied to combat, you should check out my recent video about advice for building combat encounters. I think it's pretty useful. Until next time, play fair and have fun.